Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the channel. If you're new here and you enjoy listening to horror stories, click subscribe down below and join us. I upload every single day. Please leave a like before we get started. Back in 2015, my mum got me a job through Craigslist working as a band camp helper. The job was supposed to be helping the kids at the band camp clean their instruments, get ready for rehearsal, and then packing away all of the crap chairs, music stands, equipment, rubbish, sheets of music flying around the room. I didn't like the idea of doing this. No 18 year old would, but my mum was so eager to give me my first weekend job that she just ended up signing up for me. I didn't really have a say in whether I should or shouldn't do this, but if I had done, I would have obviously said no, and she knew that. I was just gaming on my laptop, when out of nowhere my mum barges into my room to break the news to me. I couldn't believe what she had just got me into. As if working at a gas station or grocery store wasn't bad enough. Instead, she had picked me to go and work with 30 odd kids playing musical instruments. Not only was I about to now get paid pittance, but I was also about to get a banging headache from probably a band that couldn't even play properly. My first shift would be at the band camp in only three weeks time. It was around August, and I remember the weather had been boiling hot, so I wasn't looking forward to staying in a tent for the weekend. After this, I would only come to their rehearsals, so twice a week. I don't know why my mum even bothered to get me this job. The pay's awful, and it's not even a regular thing. I know. Makes absolutely no sense. When I turned up on my first day, it was exactly how I could have imagined it. There were kids running around, screaming, crying, and fighting. Eight-year-olds blowing trumpets that sounded awful and completely out of tune. Kids banging drumsticks against snare drums. This was going to be my life now. I'm now a band camp helper. Oh god, I thought to myself. The daunting task of trying to keep all these kids safe and make sure their instruments weren't stolen or damaged, seemed near impossible to me. For the first couple hours I was there, I was shown around by one of the supervisors named Danny. He took me round to the different tents, and then showed me the storage room with all the instruments and equipment inside. There were piles upon piles of music cases, sheets and papers of music, and also stands for people to put their music on. I myself have never played a musical instrument in my entire life, and I don't want to. It doesn't interest me in the slightest. Once he had showed me around, he took me over to the depot area. It was kind of like a lobby hut where all the people in charge would stay during the band camp meetings. There was a band master, who was a short stubby guy with a bald head. He was a weird guy, didn't really talk much, and gave me kind of weird vibes. Danny was alright though, he showed me round, and I quickly became friends with him. He was around my age in his early 20s, and at the time, I got the feeling that he didn't really enjoy what he was doing. He too was just there either because his mum forced him, or maybe the money? But the money argument wouldn't make much sense, as he'd be paid basically double if he worked at Walmart, for example. All of a sudden out of nowhere, I was sat round in this lobby hut when I hear a loud bell ringing from across the field. Danny jumps up out of his seat and instructs me to do the same. We all come huddling out of this little lobby hut to find all the kids running around in a circle gathered together. Apparently the bell ringing means that everyone has to congregate together in the same area. This is the start of the first rehearsal. Marching. One hour of marching and drill exercise on the field outside. My job was to just sit and relax and keep an eye on everyone, 
If any of the younger ones needed the toilet, then I'd walk them to it, and make sure they were okay. Then I'd walk them back, seeing as the toilet was quite a way away, behind the storage room. I only had to take one person to the toilet, a little girl named Evie. She was pretty quick and it was all fine, and then I walked her back, holding her hand. When I finally got back, I sat back in my chair and watched them for another half hour or so. To say this was boring would be an understatement. My mind was literally numbing from within. I couldn't even look at my phone or do anything, as this was against the rules that Danny had told me. Once I had finally sat there for what felt like ages and ages, the drill and the marching maneuvers were over. We all went back to the main lobby hut and started eating some lunch. My mum was due to pick me up in the evening, but I was also given the option of sleeping over at the night. I didn't really feel comfortable sleeping in a tent, so I opted for the option of mum to come up and get me and take me back to my bed for the night. The rest of that day went real fast. They did some more rehearsals with their instruments, which gave me a massive headache and confirmed that yes, they're like any usual high school band. They sound like shit. Mum picked me up as my head was pounding. I stood there at the entrance to the campsite, praying that she had brought some snacks for me. I was still starving hungry as I hadn't brought enough lunch with me in my lunchbox. The food they had on offer was only for the people in the band, so I was kind of screwed for the most of the day. Once I got back home, I must have gorged myself on so many donuts and so many bowls of ice cream that I lost count. I felt huge, I felt like I couldn't even move. I was incapacitated lying on my back on my bed, listening to some chill step music on my phone. The next day was due to be some more rehearsals, but it was a much more busier day. This day would be drill and marching exercises, but whilst playing. This meant that I'd have a lot of work to do, seeing as I'd had to organise the instruments, the equipment, the drummer's straps and their snare drums, their cases, etc. When I got down there, Danny was already starting to set things up. Most of the kids hadn't woken up yet and were still in their tents. He rang the bell and they all come out, hurrying together over to the congregation area. I was trying to work headlessly and tirelessly to get all this stuff together. My job also, during this second day, was to help the cooks make dinner for the kids. I didn't see this on the job description, and mum never mentioned anything about being a chef, but Danny basically forced me and said that I was needed. I wasn't about to argue with one of my employers, so I just quietly and silently agreed, nodding my head in approval. That rehearsal that morning was so stressful that I got a headache not only from the noise, but the pure stress coming from my bones. Half of the kids had the wrong instruments, some were damaged, and a couple of them passed out during rehearsal. To say it was a nightmare would be 100% true. I didn't get any time to sit down, let alone any time to use the restroom and take a break for myself. By the end of that three hour rehearsal, I was exhausted, my legs were aching, and I was bursting for the toilet. Once I had finally cleared everything away, I ran to the toilet with my bladder heavy, trying not to piss myself. I let it all out, came back to the lobby hut and drank a huge gulp of my drink. I was starving hungry, but I had no time to grab my lunch, seeing as I now had to go into the other place to help the cooks make their dinner. I went on over to these huts. These are different huts to the lobby and the congregation area. They're like annexes, or chalet type style things. I don't know what you call them, but they look like mini houses, really low down for short people. When I walked in, I was immediately hit by the smell of the food. The aroma, it smelt vile. Like this food reminded me of back in kindergarten and high school, when the din ladies would make up the slop and expect you to eat it. I was first told to put on an apron, a pair of gloves, and even a hairnet because I have medium to long hair for a guy. If that wasn't humiliating enough, 
They also made me put these weird nets over my shoes, kind of like a plastic bag that stops the dirt going over the floor. I have no idea why they asked me to do that. It quite literally made zero sense whatsoever. Once I came over to the food section, they had around 15 grills. They were making grilled cheese sandwiches, stew, bacon, eggs. It was the most bizarre combination of food I'd ever seen cooked together in my life. I thought my girlfriend and my sister eating raw carrots with a roast dinner was weird, but this, this was a whole new level of weird. None of these combinations would have gone together, but once the head cook explained to me that a lot of the kids are picky and have allergies or diseases like celiacs, it kind of made sense. My job was to take care of some of the fries and also grill the bacon. I did absolutely fine, but I couldn't help but shake the smell of how vile this place was. I couldn't tell if it was the food, someone in this kitchen, or some mold or dampness coming from the walls. Something just didn't smell right. It was time to dish up. The bell started ringing outside, and before I knew it, I had a queue of over 50 kids right in front of me, waiting for me to serve up their slop and burnt bacon. The head cook was pretty pissed off, seeing as I'd left the bacon in the grill for way too long. It was so dark in there, that unless I could have shined a flashlight down there, there's no way I could have told how much or how well done the bacon was. I served up and by the end of it was starving. I was so hungry, I felt like I could have just eaten the slop right in front of me, and it would have actually satiated me. All the kids were now sat down in the cafeteria, they were stuffing their faces and some were just coming back for seconds and thirds. I was finally given the all clear to leave and go back to the lobby hut, so that's what I did. When I went back, I grabbed my stuff out of my lunchbox and started eating it. This afternoon's plans were some more music theory. Music theory is pretty pointless for me being there, because usually that's just down to the music teachers. But it still meant that I had to do the toilet trips, as usual. Once I finished lunch, I made my way over to the area where we were doing music theory. It was quite a sunny day out, so they had chosen to do it outside. There were a couple of benches and a whole bunch of random seats placed out into a square. The kids started coming over once they had all finished having their lunch, and then I realised that they call lunch dinner at this place. I have no idea why, but I'm guessing I got there later, after they'd eaten their breakfast and lunch. When I finally sat down and realised that I'd have to wait for three whole hours, holding hands with these kids and taking them to the toilet, I didn't actually know what I was getting myself into. For the first ten minutes, there were already four kids asking to go to the toilet. Granted they'd just had a bunch to drink and to eat, it didn't make much sense. I took them all in groups this time. Each child was taking way too long in the toilet, and I knew that something wasn't quite right. I could hear one of the kids using the toilet from the outside. It sounded like he had the worst stomach ever and was going to war in that bathroom. Before I knew it, I couldn't even get one of the kids to leave the toilet. He said his stomach was hurting so bad, that he simply couldn't get off the toilet. Danny came running over, saying that there was another six kids saying they needed the toilet, and they simply couldn't hold it. They followed closely behind him, and before we knew it, we had almost 20 of the 50 kids flooding to the toilets, vomiting, and with projectile diarrhea. I'm not going to go through all the specifics and details with you guys, this is practically pointless and disgusting. But just imagine 20 kids, all in agony and pain, shitting out their assholes like a jet wash and throwing up all over themselves. I'm not paid enough for this. I turned around and went back to the lobby, grabbed my bags and decided to walk all the way home abandoning Danny and all of the kids. I never heard from Danny or anyone else after this, but apparently Danny called my mum and gave her a load of shit for what I did. 
What was I supposed to do? Heal them? Wipe their asses? The next thing they'll be doing is blaming me for the food poisoning. There's no way that burnt bacon caused them that problem. Absolutely not. Obviously none of them died and they all got better eventually. But that was a turning point for me. And a little horror story, where my mum forced me to get a job through Craigslist, and I ended up witnessing 20 kids have food poisoning right in front of me. I was round my auntie's house, I think I was 9 years old, and my older brother was with me. There was only a 3 year age gap, so he wasn't old enough to take care of me or babysit me at home. It was a summer break and mum and dad still worked full time, so our auntie had to take care of us in the meantime. Auntie Anne was a type of lady that took no shit, but she was also fair and reasoning when you actually behaved. She didn't really care much about us, and she would drag us around on our errands. She would meet workers, employees of her company, her friends, she'd do anything but pay us attention or any kind of care. She didn't starve us or anything, refuse us the use of a toilet or a drink, but being with her was like a death trap. It felt like a nightmare or like a prison for my own mind. One thing Auntie Anne would always do is randomly go around buying things. I remember this even from as young as around 5 years old. She would always be haggling, trying to get a better price on some stupid thing for sale. Her house was full of so much clutter that you wouldn't even imagine it. I'd have to put up photos for you guys to actually believe what I'm saying, but as you walk in through her front door, you can't actually see the walls. They're blocked and obscured by stacks upon stacks of boxes, magazines, bags, and all kinds of weird shit toppled on top of each other. It was hard getting around her house, and even in the damn toilet, she had her clutter stacked up against the wall. All of this were things she bought. She started this company when she was a teenager. Well, that's so what the family say. I don't know if I believe that. She used to try and sell things on, and even had her own website for certain things like the clothes and the perfumes that she would buy. Auntie Anne was divorced, so I'm guessing that's where all the money came from to fund her stupid little business. You can probably judge by the way I'm writing that I don't like Auntie Anne. I don't get on with her and I don't really trust her to be honest. My older brother Ben didn't either, but he definitely got on with her a lot more. There was one instance where I remember Auntie Anne driving us both out to grab something. I didn't know at the time, but it turns out she had found Craigslist and was using that for the next few years of her searching career. We turned up at this random property, it was a few hours drive from her house and me and Ben were exhausted by the time we got there. I wanted to get out and stretch my legs, but Auntie Anne noticed me leaning for the door handle and immediately slapped my hand away from it. I sighed in pain and kept my hands to myself as Ben told me not to try anything stupid. Auntie Anne used to get stressed whenever it came to negotiations or deals with anything she was buying. I remember multiple times her having arguments with the people about why they wouldn't nudge on the price or why there was something wrong with what she was buying. A handful of times she almost got into fights with other women because of it. That's not fun to see, especially as a kid that isn't even 10 years old. My auntie Anne got out the car and then locked me and Ben inside of it. My legs were aching so bad I was trying everything I could to just stand up inside the car. My auntie had a Mercedes sports car, the roof was so low that you couldn't even stand up, 
even back then when I was only like four foot ten. We watched her both walk up the rest of the drive and knock on the front door. She stood there waiting on the porch, but no one seemed to answer at first. Once I kept my eyes off her, I looked over at Ben and just started talking with him. The next moment I looked back, Auntie Anne's disappeared and we can't see her anywhere. Ben also took his eyes off her and has no idea where she actually went. I started looking all around the property. The yard was fairly large and was full of all this shit like a rusted tractor and a bunch of tools laid out on the grass. There were no sign of Auntie Anne though. None at all. I tried to get out the car and then realised she had locked us in. Ben knew one way to get out, which was to unlock the main driver's side door by pulling up that weird lock bolt thing. They only had these on cars built before 2010. It's a memory, like the window winders. To open the window, you have to wind it. Only OGs will remember that. 80s and 90s babies, and before. Ben decided to pop the lock, and we both got out of the vehicle. We looked all around. Auntie Anne! Auntie Anne! Me and Ben start calling all around, our voices echoing throughout the property and the house. None of the windows were open, and as we got closer to the house, the property itself seems to look like it's been boarded up or closed away. There's no way someone actually lives here, I turn and say to Ben. Well, you'll be surprised, he says back. We start walking around the property, wondering if maybe Auntie Anne had gone round to the back to see if there was a door there. When we got round to the back, sure enough there actually was a door. We went up to the door and I could see it was slightly open. Auntie Anne? Auntie Anne? We knocked against the door as it creaked further open. Once we knocked it, it pushed it slightly. The door was flimsy and extremely light. Something as light as a knock from my small fist actually knocked it further inwards, revealing more of the room that we were stood in front of. This back room seemed to be the kitchen. It was in complete disarray and smelt awful. I remember seeing dirty dishes with maggots, flies, and even mold all over. There was no sign of Auntie Anne and I could have agreed right then and there that what Ben said was most likely true. Someone could live here, but they shouldn't, that's for sure. Neither of us went inside, as we were put off by the smell alone. I grabbed the door and shut it, then we both go back to the car. We wondered maybe she went somewhere else, like next door. There was a property a few hundred meters to the left, but that was it. Houses out here were far and few between, so we didn't really know what to do next. We simply got back in the car and just sat there together. The aching in my legs had kind of gone now, seeing as we had walked for a few minutes. I felt a lot better, even though I was getting kind of thirsty at this point. I must have been sat in the car with Ben for another 10 or 15 minutes, when all of a sudden I see the front door to the house open. Ah, it's Auntie Anne, I think to myself. She's bought something, and now she's coming back. I can't quite make out the figure that leaves the door, but as I look closer and closer, and the figure comes further out from the darkness of the house, I realise that that figure is way too tall to be Auntie Anne. It looks nothing like her, and the figure has short hair, Auntie Anne has long hair, once this figure comes down the steps of the porch, me and Ben both realise this isn't Auntie Anne. In fact, this is a fully grown man. He's got a beard. He looks to be in around his early 40s. Jeans, boots, a leather jacket, and some weird type of vest that he was wearing under it. He started walking towards the car. Ben was going to get out to ask him what was happening. But then both of us felt this really weird sense of danger come over us. It's kind of hard to explain in writing, but when you're a kid, you kind of get this sixth sense, 
or this superficial feeling that you're in danger, your young mind shouldn't know it or comprehend it, but your gut feeling, your heart and your soul does. That's the feeling I got. Visually, I saw a man just walking towards a car. Nothing to be worried about, right? But my heart, my mind, and my own stomach started to tell me that something was seriously wrong. As the man walked towards the car, Bane quickly leaned over the front seats and popped down the locking bolt. The whole car was now locked, and there was no way the man could get in. At this point we still didn't know for certain if this man was a threat, but both of us had that gut feeling that something just wasn't right at all. The man got to the car, and the first thing he did was come up to the window on my side. He raised one of his hands and started knocking on the glass. There's no way I was going to wind down my window. I didn't even try. Instead, Ben leans across me and tells to the man, Hey, where's the lady? Have you seen a lady called Anne? Once he had said something like this, the man didn't respond to him. Instead, he just looks at him with his soulless, scary eyes. He takes a few steps to the right. His body's in line with the driver's side door. That's when he decided to pull back his fists and start punching the car door. Whilst he was doing this, Ben started yelling at him. I broke out into tears and started crying. The man managed to punch through the window, shattering the glass inwards all over both of us. Then he unlocked the door using the main bolt that Ben had pushed down. He got in the car, and out of nowhere, unexpectedly pulled out the car keys to Anne's car from his pocket. He then popped the keys into the ignition, started the car up, and began backing out of his own driveway. Once he got onto the main road, we were both screaming and crying. Ben, although he had been brave up until this point, had completely cracked. He couldn't hold his masculine composure anymore and he had now turned into an absolute baby. The man started speeding along the road, heading back the way we came to get here. There was no sign of our Auntie Anne, and this guy wasn't even talking to us. Once he made it back to civilization, closer to the town, we were in a more built-up area for traffic. The occasional person started staring at our window, wondering why there was glass all over the place, and why this guy was just driving along with no right window. At this point, Ben whispered in my ear that we need to both try and jump out the car at some point. The man was looking back in the mirror cautiously. He looked scary as hell, and I can still see his face and eyes even to this day. Ben had tried to get my attention multiple times. I was so scared, the only thing I was paying attention to was this guy. He was now controlling our entire life, and everything we'd ever thought we were going to do in the future basically came crumbling down in front of our very faces. Where was this guy driving us? Why was he taking us? What happened to Auntie Anne? Are we going to die? These are just some of the questions that were going through my mind in these moments. We must have been in the car with this guy for around 20 minutes, until eventually Ben tries one last time to get my attention. This time, he slowly and sneakily moved his hand over to my thigh. He pinched me ever so gently and I glanced over to him. A few milliseconds break from my own terror and fear. I look over at Ben, and he tells me to get out the car. He doesn't say it. He doesn't even whisper it. He simply mimes it with his lips. We came up to a stop sign. We're in the middle of a neighborhood. And for some weird reason, this guy, although kidnapping us and probably killing Aunt Anne, was abiding by all the road traffic laws. I opened the door. I took my belt off. And I rolled out of that seat faster than I've ever done anything in my life. I didn't even know if Ben made it out. I just kept running, running and running. Eventually, 
I felt hands come up behind the back of my hips. I started screaming until I realized they were Ben's hands. He grabbed me. The man behind had now got out the car and was chasing both of us. Ben pulled me up onto the porch of someone's property and began banging on their front door. We didn't have any time to just stand there and wait for them to answer. Ben made the decision to turn the door handle and by the absolute grace of God, it was open. We both went inside and shut the door behind the guy. He didn't bother even trying to come in. We were met with two men. They must have been in their 20s and they just looked at us in a really weird lost way. Ben explained everything that just happened and brought them over to their living room window to point out this guy in Auntie Anne's car. He got into the car, reversed, and started driving back the way we came from. The two guys who were in this house when we got in slash broke in were now on the phone to the cops. The cops arrived pretty fast. They sat us down and asked everything that happened to us. We didn't know the address of where we were, so the cops decided to take us in the back of one of their cars. We told them where to go and we led them back to the house where Auntie Anne had gone missing. When we got there, we found Auntie Anne in the most horrific state possible. I've only ever been told how she was found, seeing as I wasn't allowed in. The cops wouldn't let me in to see her. All I saw was her being taken away on one of those trolleys that the ambulance scoot everyone around on. She had cloths covering her body, masks strapped to her face, and all these monitors being carried out with her by over eight medics. I was never told what actually happened to her, but I'm assuming it's something that I don't even want to mention. We don't really go around Auntie Anne's anymore. We didn't after this happened to her. She changed and became pretty timid. She closed up her business and basically just sold off everything she had through one of her brothers. Her brother did all the work selling her belongings, and she's then just been left with the retirement. She gets scared to go out on her own, meet new people, and sometimes even just have us around the house. Not only is this sad, but it always makes me wonder, why did that guy do that, and why did he try and take us in the car with him? I think I've watched a lot of true crime in my lifetime, but one thing that always baffles me is the motives and reasons behind the guy's or the girl's actions. If you're going to kill someone, do something horrible to them, and then abduct their kids or nieces, why would you do that? What's your reasoning behind it? Or is there something in their mind that actually finds that shit fun? I guess that's why we have mental asylums. Because that's where most of these guys belong. And left they get the death sentence. My auntie is okay. I know all of you are commenting, wondering how she's doing. She'll never be better or healed from what happened. Physically she is, but mentally, she never will be. I'm a collector of Warhammer pieces. I also play it, but it's not so popular nowadays. For those of you wondering what Warhammer actually is, just imagine toy soldiers, but an adult version. When I was younger, I was always fascinated with board games, strategic games, and anything strategy or war. It made me feel alive, and that's one of the reasons I got into Warhammer. I enjoyed being competitive with other people and having that side of strategy that meant that you could calculate moves, opponents' advances, and so on. Without boring you on my nerdy bullshit, let me start with what actually happened to me as an experience of using Craigslist. I used to use eBay, Craigslist, Facebook, 
and one other website that I can't remember the name of to source my pieces. One evening, I was doing my routine checks of all four sites when I came across a rare piece on Craigslist. This piece was worth well over $300, had been hand painted intricately, and was one I was looking for. I decided to contact the seller. Their location was obviously held up, but there was always a chance that they were close, or could at least do delivery. The guy didn't answer at first, so I tried calling again two hours later after I'd eaten dinner. I lived at home by myself. I had no wife or kids, and very few friends other than at the Warhammer Club, so most of my time was just put towards this. Once I had done the dishes and finished my dinner, I went back over to my laptop and called up the number once more time. This time I got an answer, and a guy on the other end was sounding rather raspy, and I couldn't really make out what he was saying. Once we finally came to an agreement, and the guy told me that he lived in Las Vegas, which wasn't actually that far from me, I was willing to make the 5 hour drive down, but I would wait till the weekend, because I worked full time Monday to Friday. Other than this guy's weird raspy voice like the Kennedy guy that's running for president, I think that this guy seemed normal. I asked him a few more questions about his collections and he did actually know what he was talking about. It wasn't as if this guy was scamming or anything, he definitely knew what he was talking about when it came to Warhammer and collectors. I saved the address, it was Tuesday so I still had over three whole days of work left before I could travel up and get it. When the Saturday morning came, I woke up at 3.30 in the morning. I couldn't even contain my own excitement. It was so bad that I ended up waking up so early. I wasn't hungry. For breakfast, I usually eat croissants, chocolate spread, or some type of oatmeal. Breakfast for me is my favorite meal of the day. But during that Saturday morning, I was so excited, so on edge to go and get this piece, that I didn't even think to take a sip of water, let alone have my croissant breakfast with my coffee. Before I knew it, the house was locked up and I was hopped in the car heading down the highway south. I stopped off once to go for a piss, and then after that, I was determined not to stop again to make up some good time and ground. Once I arrived, I was using Google Maps to try and find his house. The address I would looked at on Google Maps beforehand using a street view, it looked like a neighbourhood which had seen better days, but I wasn't there to buy the house, I was there to buy the collector's piece, that's all I needed to remember. Once I finally pulled upside this guy's house, I decided it would be best not to go into his drive. My mum always taught me, when you come to someone's house who you don't know, just leave your car out on the road, never pull up on their drive, as one it's rude, and two you might need to drive away in an emergency. I parked my car up, popping two of the wheels up on the sidewalk, which no doubt would get me a citation written if any of the local cops were bored. One thing I noticed about Vegas was how dry the air was, obviously it's a desert, but this was way worse than I thought it would be. My asthma and my allergies were playing rampant. I must have taken at least eight puffs of my blue inhaler at this point, but it wasn't helping at all. I was wheezing, puffing and coughing, just making my way up this dude's footpath to get to his door. When I got to his door, I gave five firm knocks. Those knocks were more intentions than any intentions I'd had in my whole life. I couldn't wait, and even though I was basically and practically suffocating with this air, I was willing to take that, as long as I got this piece. The anticipation was so deafening, that the silence was almost torture. The neighbourhood was so quiet, it was almost like it was just abandoned. I stood there waiting for someone to answer, but no one ever did. I decided to knock a few more times, 
but that was absolutely wasteful. I walked back to my car pissed off, thinking this guy had just played me up, trolled me, pranked me and took the piss out of me. I decided to call him while I was sat in my car at the end of his yard. He did actually pick up surprisingly, and he told me that he was inside, but that I needed to go in to meet him. I found this rather suspicious, but I didn't think twice, getting back out my car and heading back towards the bedroom where he said he was sat in. I opened his door and sure enough it creaks open. He told me that I didn't need to take my shoes off, as long as they weren't too muddy or dirty. They were clean, one of my best pairs actually, so that sorted that. I closed the door behind me and looked all around. It looked similar to my house, not too clean, but not too dirty. It looked like the type of place where a single guy lived by himself, which is what most guys are when they're into Warhammer. I'm willing to admit that. What? It's just facts. I make my way up the stairs and start calling out. No one's calling back or answering my calls. I felt a little uneasy and kind of awkward in this stranger's house. When I got up to the bedroom, I decided to turn right as instructed by the guy on the phone out in my car. I got to the door and I turned the door handle. As I turned the door handle I could hear someone coughing, but it wasn't in the room I was opening the door to. The coughing was coming from a different room across from the staircase. I kept opening the door until eventually I could see everything within the room. There was no sign of anyone, but there were two Warhammer pieces on the table. It was like a mini desk propped up against the wall, with the view of the road below by the window. These pieces weren't my pieces, they were still impressive, but they weren't as good as the one I'd come to get. I stood in this bedroom, the guy told me he'd be in here, but he wasn't. I went all the way back down the staircase, led down the stairs, walked around the living room, and decided to call out a few more times. Eventually, I start hearing more coughing coming from upstairs. That's funny, I thought. Why aren't they answering me? I can clearly hear them, so surely they can hear me, right? Well, I went back upstairs, tried to follow the sound of the coughing until eventually I was outside a shut door. I was certain that the coughing was coming from the other side of this door that I was stood by. I knocked on it firmly, and the coughing got louder each time I knocked. This is bizarre. What the fuck's going on? I decide just to go in anyway. I didn't know. In that moment, I felt like something just wasn't right and someone needed my help. As I opened the door, sure enough I was right. My suspicions were true. There on the floor was a man, fitting, white froth coming out of his mouth, shaking all over the place from side to side. The man was rolling over to the side and hitting his head on the edge of the bed. Each time he hit his head on the bed, he was coughing out loudly. He was staring up at me. I could see his soul screaming for help, just in the look he was giving me. I quickly dropped the bag I was carrying with my car keys inside, knelt down and held his body in place. I popped him round and pulled his body out further into the corridor. Then I popped his left leg over, put his right shoulder by his head and rested him in the recovery position. I made sure to try and control and comfort him, but I had no idea of telling how long he had been fitting. If it's true and he's the guy that called me, then it can't have been more than a few minutes, which is still in the safe zone. But if this wasn't the guy I spoke to on the phone, and this someone else, then this guy could have been fitting for ages for all I knew. Because of this fact, I thought that it would be best to call 911 regardless. The Las Vegas ambulance turned up pretty fast, very fast in fact, way faster than the ones in Colorado for my mother who passed away at her house in front of me. The guy stopped fitting before they got there. I wiped the froth from his mouth and tried to comfort him a little more. I held him in place and introduced myself as I knelt below him. When the medics arrived I went downstairs to let them in. They came upstairs and took the guy away. I ended up staying in a hotel for a couple of nights. 
Woods. When the guy was discharged from hospital, he asked me to come back round his house. When I went back round, I was met with him sat in the living room with all four of his collector pieces and $10,000 worth of cash on the table. He handed it all to me and said that he refused to let me go unless I took it all. There may or may not have been a weapon on the table threatening me to take it all. This guy thanked me. He said I saved his life. I don't know how true that is, but according to him, it was the first fit he had ever had, and they seemed to think it was because of an allergic reaction to a new cleaning chemical he used all over his house that morning. I did think it smelt funny as I walked around, but I never really paid attention to it. Hey guys, this is the host commentator slash storyteller. If you enjoyed tonight's video, please leave a like if you haven't already. Can we get 500 likes on today's video? That would mean so much. Thank you so much guys. Also, if you enjoy these videos and you're new, welcome. I am your host commentator. Please hit subscribe and join the channel. And also, comment down below your opinions your criticism, or your own experiences that you've had that relate to these stories. This is still an interactive channel and a community, so if you want to share these videos with your friends, family members, or anyone else you know who enjoys horror stories or stories for sleeping, then that would also be much appreciated. Thank you to everyone for all the support, and as always, please continue to tune in to my videos to help me grow my channel. Here on YouTube there are a lot of storytelling channels that use AI and computers. Not only is this damaging to our genre and niche, this can be very very difficult to grow as a legitimate organic storyteller. People are using promotion methods like Google Ads and they are stealing people's stories off of Reddit. This is sad to see. Please support true storytelling channels by liking, subscribing, commenting, and sharing our videos. Thank you, and I'll catch you in tomorrow's video.